What is up, Brad fans? Got a great episode here for you. Uh, before we get to that, a couple quick announcements. As always, follow us on the socials uh, at 2 brad for you uh, Twitter and Instagram. You can hit me up on Twitter and Instagram at bvamparadon. And again, we are looking for questions for our 50th episode. We want to do a, an answer your questions. So uh, get in touch with the show on Twitter, Instagram. Also go to the show website, 2 brad for youwordpresscom There is a contact uh, box there. You can submit your questions there. Um, and yeah, get in touch with us. Let us know because the 50th episode is coming up and we want to hear from you. We want to answer some of your questions. So we think it could be a lot of fun. Please do that. Um, wherever you're getting this podcast, rate, subscribe, comment, that always helps. And yeah, just follow us on the, the Twitter and Instagram at too Brad for you. All right. Now to this interview that I was very, very excited to do, very uh, happy that uh, these folks reached out to us because um, I was able to sit down with Liz Marshall, an award-winning Canadian filmmaker. She does documentary films. Uh, her work's been released theatrically, broadcast around the world, um, and seen by thousands, thousands and thousands of people all over the world. And she has a new film coming out called Meet the Future. And that is meat like the food, like the flesh, not meat as in the meeting. And this film is all about the birth of the cellular meat industry. So this is uh, lab-grown meat, I guess you would call it, but it's basically you take a sample of cells from an animal and then grow the 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 cells into a cultured um, meat product. Anyway, it's really, really interesting. And Liz was uh, able to follow one of the pioneers in this in this field, a man named Uma Valetti, uh, from the beginning of his company, uh, Memphis Meats. And she followed him for roughly three years or so, I think. Um, so it's a really great uh, film, really great topic. I was able to see it. And I was very, very thankful that Liz Marshall... Um, joined us on the show. So uh, I want to thank her, especially because she took the time to do this interview while she was away from her home base in Toronto, uh, which led to a bit of technical issues that she really persevered through. So I want to thank her especially for that uh, and just let you know that the audio quality is maybe not the best that it could be, but we were dealing with some some issues. So I hope you still enjoy the interview. You should still um, check it out because it's a really great conversation about the film, about her process of making a science-based uh, film. Um, and like I said, I think it's a topic that the Two Brad For You listeners will enjoy, the cellular meat industry. So for the folks in Canada, the documentary will be airing on the CBC Thursday, May 7th. Uh, so do check that out uh, for everyone, Canada and outside. Uh, go to LizMars.com to learn more about Liz Marshall and all of her previous films, including this upcoming one, Meet the Future. You can go to MeetTheFuture.com or MTFFilm.com to find out more about the film uh, and where you'll be able to see it outside of Canada as those details come available. Uh, Liz gives all this information at the end of the interview as well. Um, Facebook, Meet the Future Film. Uh, Instagram, Meet the Future Film. And Twitter, MTF Film. There you go. Uh, that's enough for me. Uh, and I hope you enjoy my conversation with filmmaker Liz Marshall. Excellent. So, yeah, thanks so much for for joining us on the show today. And um, let's just jump right into it. I just finished watching Meet the Future, your latest film. Really, really enjoyed it. It's a topic that, you know, I'm interested in as a sort of science guy. And I know that our audience will be interested in this topic as well. This sort of what are they calling it now? Cellular ag agriculture, clean meat, all of these kind of things. So I'm just curious, you're 
your previous work has taken on a sort of environmental issues before and societal issues, but what, what brought you to, you know, the clean meat industry? What, what drew you into that topic? Yeah. Hi, Brad. Nice to see you. Um, so I would say that my, my, my film work has been a continuum. So I really do feel that one film just naturally leads to the next film. And so when I reflect back on the body of my feature length documentary work, so this is my fourth feature length uh, documentary, um, I can see the progression around uh, exactly what you just said, which is, um, you know, uh, so for example, in 2010, I focused on the right to water movement and the commodification of water in the fight um, against privatization and corporatization of the world's water source. Um, from there, I went to The Ghosts in Our Machine, which is um, about uh, a very complex uh, issue, which is a moral issue. And the film was seen uh, widely on every continent by hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and that's a film about uh, the animals, the, the invisible animals, the billions of animals that we have marginalized and that we use within uh, giant consumer industries like food, like entertainment, like fashion, biomedical research. Anyways, um, fast forward a few years later, and what I was really looking for is um, an opportunity to focus in a laser focused kind of way on a story that presents um, a potential game changing solution. And I, I came across the emergence of cellular agriculture. That's sort of the umbrella term to describe um, you know, the innovation of uh, what's also referred to as clean meat, cultivated meat, cultured meat, um, and uh, cell-based meat. Um, and also, <laughs> there's companies in the space that uh, are innovating eggs and innovating dairy, um, all from animal cells. So it's this really, really fascinating, uh, very current... Uh, birth of an industry uh, which is global, which is um, so timely, um, so critical right now as we face so many world um, pressing critical issues. Um, so I think in a, in, to simplify, you know, what, what, what drew me to the story, I think it's the big idea behind it. I think it's the people that are driving it. And in particular, what I what I chose to do is focus on uh, largely one individual um, as an entry point to explore uh, the momentum and and the moral underpinnings uh, behind this this movement, this industry. And his name is Dr. Uma Valetti, and he's a cardiologist. He trained at the Mayo Clinic. He's from um, South India. And he um, and his wife moved to America. Um, and uh, basically, as an entrepreneur, he has become a leader um, and in this in this emerging industry. And so the film actually chronicles his rise and prominence as well. So it's 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 an issue film, yes, and it's also a character driven documentary about a pioneer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he was a really interesting character. And that kind of, you know, when I was watching the film and thinking about this interview, there's two sort of things, broad things that I, I was interested in. One is, of course, the characters. And that's always, you know, you always need good characters to tell a good story. But then also this, um, the idea that this, you know, the, 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 the need for a new source of meat or a clean source of meat. I think a lot of people 
when they hear about this, they think instantly of the sort of ethical arguments behind it, and they might not realize that there's sort of a bigger issue in terms of being able to feed the whole planet. Climate is a really, is a really, really big one. Um, there was people in the film that mentioned the, you know, the spread of viruses, you know, with when you have feedlots and these large things. So there's a lot of things around it. So it's, it really is one of these big, big idea, you know, big problems facing the planet, like so many of the, the things that are currently facing the planet. And so that's always interesting to me is the idea that can we just technology our way out of these things? And then this comes back to the characters as well, because I think sometimes the guys that the men or the women that are involved in the sort of tech startup, they kind of have these stereotypes about them as just people that think we can just science our way out of everything. So I'm just wondering, you know, what your thoughts are on that? Like, can we science your way out of this? How did Uma, you know, maybe how you met him and what was he like as a person? Did he kind of fit those stereotypes or what were his motivations for, for getting into this? Yeah, great. I think those are two great questions. Um, I'll just quickly say that innovation uh, has brought us to where we are today in society um, through, you know, the industrial revolution, um, the way that, you know, meat is produced. You know, there's so much innovation that has brought us to where we are. And we need innovation to solve the problems. And we need that innovation now. And so, you know, whether it's science, whether it's technology, whatever, whatever it is, it's innovation. And as, as a human species, we are capable of so much. And we've gotten ourselves into a really bad situation. And we, we need viable transformation, transformative tools to um, move us forward. If there is a forward, and I believe that there is, then, you know, the, the birth of cell, cell-based meat is a fascinating, potentially game-changing solution that could solve so many of the problems that we're facing. Like you mentioned, uh, we're having a climate crisis or environmental emergency. Um, there are health pandemics. We're living in one right now. We're living under the grip of one right now that is a result of zoonoses, zoonotic disease, um, which is caused by germs that spread between animals and people. Um, so, you know, antibiotic resistance is one of the biggest public health challenges of our time as well. So, you know, the cell-based meat companies expect to significantly reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, their uh, goal is to have an environmental impact in terms of having a very small footprint. Um, there's all kinds of great research um, done about the anticipated benefits to animals and to the environment and for human health. Now, keep in mind that there's no data because it's not scaled up. It's not on the market yet. Um, these startup companies around the globe are in research and development. And um, there's a lot of research and there's a lot of development and that's what the film is all about. It's about the genesis phase of this industry through the eyes of the pioneer, Uma Valetti, who's the CEO of a company called Memphis Meats, which is the first company in the world in the cell-based meat uh, space. And when I uh, decided and when Uma, you know, chose to go on this journey with with me and, and the film team back in 2016, the idea was always to humanize this topic through a human story. Um, because I believe, and you can look, you can see this in various art forms, that it's the human experience and the human story that anchors uh, our interest. 
So um, what the film really essentially is about is about the unfolding and the momentum of this teeny tiny startup company. And we witness various, you know, benchmarks and incredible uh, twists and turns along the way over three and a half years. And, and um, that's the entry point to really explore and present to the world a big idea. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, and to mention, I'd, I'd like to get to a few of the twists and turns without giving away too, too much. But again, I'm curious in the like you said, you know, the human stories, the characters and the sort of motivations behind the people that are getting into this. We get to meet um, not just Uma, but some other members of the team. And so I'm curious, you know, they all have their different backgrounds and they're all coming at this um from a different point of interest i guess but was there sort of a unifying interest around the team uh uma and his team sort of you know like the the big picture obviously to to change the world to provide this solution but like were they you know vegetarians were a lot of them vegetarians was there sort of this common themes that run amongst them or were they all kind of coming at it from their different uh from a different goal so we were there from the beginning, you know, the spring of 2016, um, when they just moved into their first uh, facility, research and development facility in the outskirts of Silicon Valley. And it was, a, it was a little team of just a few people. And it's grown significantly. Um, I think they're up to about 50 people now. Um, and Uma, as his vision as a CEO and a co-founder, um, he really um, lives by the vision that he talks about, which is creating and shaping a big tent, meaning bringing diversity, bringing sort of uh, a reflection of the world together under the same roof. So he prides himself on um, having vegans that work there that are uh, motivated ethically um, uh, around the animal issue um, to having, you know, meat eaters that just absolutely love, love, love the taste of meat and they love eating meat and they're motivated around um, you know, uh, pushing the needle forward and being on the cutting edge of uh, the next big thing around innovation, around solutions to the environment, around um, uh, being really excited around creating taste, texture, um, and an experience of food. You know, there's, there's foodies that work there that love food. Um, and that are motivated by uh, the issue of sustainability. So he also is really conscientious around uh, diversity and of, of making sure that there's so many uh, women that are working within the company as well. Um, I think at least half are, are women. And, and people of color and, you know, and also he's a man of color, he's of South Asian descent. So he really takes that approach to his work and that would be the best way to define him. And I think that that comes across in the film as well, because in, as a leader, as a, as a pioneer, he also takes that approach in moving this industry forward and working with a very sort of uh, broad group of stakeholders. So one of the most incredible um, milestones in the story trajectory is as a CEO, he's uh, secured investment from, you know, billionaire, billionaire influencers like Richard Branson and, and Bill Gates 
but also from the meat industry itself, Cargill and Tyson and others. And so, again, another, you know, big tent philosophy that has um, been a pragmatic, um, yeah, very practical, pragmatic uh, way of, of moving things forward and, and approaching the, uh, the growth of the industry. Mm hmm. And that was one of the things that, like, you know, I kind of expected, but it, it did strike me as well as how much he was trying to get everybody under this big tent, you know. I mean, I, I figured, you know, before I put the film on, I was like, you know, I was really curious as to whether the meat industry was going to be behind this. You know, you always kind of hear that from you know, here's kind of the same arguments or, or thoughts in the whether your fossil fuels, for example, where people are always saying, well, the fossil fuel companies are the ones that should be motivated to to make the change because their industry is changing or it's unsustainable. But we don't always see that. So I was a little surprised to see that some of the meat producers were getting involved. Um, but then you mentioned the twists and turns. There was still there was still some opposition, naturally. Uh, the labeling, what they were going to label this product as came up as one of those. And again, I don't want to give too, too much away, but we were introduced to some of the opposition, the Cattlemen's Association and some of these other places, and they had this debate centered around labeling, what they're going to call it. I'm just, did that surprise you how many stakeholders were actually in, involved in this? Like the the issue, like I said to me, I kind of had some understanding of it, but when I was watching this unfold, I thought, yeah, meat producers, but then the Cattlemen's Association came into it and you could see that there was, the impact of this is actually quite broad and there's a lot of people involved. It's not just the people producing the meat, it's the people that work packaging the meat. You know, there's a lot of people. So did you, was that surprising to you to see how, you know, how big of an impact this really has? Absolutely. And also how quickly how rapid the growth and momentum and acceleration has been from 2016 to the present. And just to give you a snapshot, it was February of this year, 2020, that Memphis Meats, um, they raised $161 million, um, towards the their first production facility that you get a glimpse of in the final chapter of the film. So, you know, um, but to answer your question, as a storyteller, as a filmmaker, I, I get really excited around nuance as opposed to sort of David and Goliath, black and white. Um, uh, of course, drama and and there are black and white issues for sure, but morally. But I think that what, what excites me about this story is that it's not what you expect it to be. You know, it's not a bunch of disruptors that are up against the um, the status quo conventional system and that they're at war with one another. Um, and who's going to win? You know, that's not the story. It's also not a story around who's going to get to market first. It's not. A, it's not necessarily a competition um, between these. Uh, or amongst these CEOs and these startup companies that have popped up all over the globe. Largely, they're really working together to try to create, um, uh, to unite and, and to um, uh, birth this industry um, in a way that has some unification and the, the, the Good Food Institute plays an enormous role. And Bruce Friedrich, the co-founder and executive director, um, has has a voice and, a, and some presence um, in the film. And, and one thing I should mention is that, uh, and so does his um, colleague, his associate, Jessica Almy, who's the director of policy. And, and she's just also whip smart, um, based in Washington, D.C., and dealing with that regulatory um, issue, which moves very quickly in the film. And, and um, I should just say that we did shoot a lot more footage with the Good Food Institute, with Bruce and with Jessica, 
um, following that regulatory uh, unfolding in Washington, D.C. But as is always the case when you're making a long-form documentary that's told over time, <laughs> you have a lot more footage. <clears throat> you have a lot more footage than than you can really, you know, shape into a 90-minute film. So, um, yeah, that's just the way it is. And I'm used to that. Um, you know, the editing process takes at least six months, you know, five to six months to do it properly, to make the right decisions, to um, experiment with different um, ideas, um, and to get through the material and make sense of all of it. Um, so, um, yes, it did surprise me the nuance and the complexity within the meat industry itself. Because on one hand, you have the meat industry investing in this new industry, and and significantly so. And you have the, the, the cell-based meat industry um, excited and, and uh, needing that support, you know? And then on the other hand, you have ranchers and farmers and workers that are threatened by it and that are fighting to protect their established brand of, you know, quote unquote, harvested in the traditional manner, which is a nice way of saying slaughtered animal flesh. I mean, that's just, you know, so clean meat, otherwise known as cultivated meat, is real meat that takes a biopsy, proliferates those cells within a, within a, a sterile environment, and grows and harvests meat from animal cells. So there's no animal slaughter. So it's a, it's a huge idea. It's, it's, I think, Often in the beginning when I was trying to get finance for this film, it was one of those things that people just could not wrap their head around it. But now it's, it's become mainstream. And I think there's a recognition um, of the timeliness, of the, um, the awe and the wonder associated with this big idea. Mm-hmm. No, I agree that it's definitely become more of a a mainstream issue. Like it's something that, you know, you you see the articles being published about it in different magazines and things like this. And even if I speak to my friends and family about it, it's something that they're now aware of where they might not have been before. And it's interesting to see people's reaction to it because it seems like it's coming quicker and quicker, like so many technologies these days. But there's such a personal relationship and people in the film mentions this too, but between food and people, you know, like you, people don't like to hear about things being messed around in there. Just look at the genetically modified food debate or anything like this. So I'm curious, you know, and I'm, I'm not, not suggesting you might have an answer to this, but like how the uptake of this will be eventually. I I feel like if you get a good product, people will will move to it. But it is such a, a personal issue. And uh, to see the characters in the film, you know, when they're even when they're debating about how they're going to market this, you know, we need a, an idea that's or a name that's suitable that the consumer will will get on board with. I found that really interesting to see that this was this was going to be a challenge for them. And uh, how big like they obviously are focused on it. So is this something that they really like? spend a lot of time thinking about how are we going to or do they really kind of have faith in the product that if we get this out there people will if it tastes good people will get it i think the consumer acceptance uh piece is one of the four is one of the pillars um that the that memphis meets and all the other startups in this space are laser focused on because if without the consumer acceptance then you really have no, you have no future. Um, and then we talked, we touched on food regulation. It needs to be regulated to get to market. That's another pillar. Um, and then of course the innovation um, 
is is another one, and then the, the funding, getting financed, and to to create the, the pragmatic ability to move this forward, um, is the other. So yeah, consumer acceptance, consumer um, awareness, is a big, huge area of focus, and and I feel that, and this is the power of documentary as a platform that the, the film will really serve that purpose too. Um, not to convert people necessarily, but to open hearts and minds to possibility of what's possible, of um, following a story that unfolds through people that want to change the world, um, to uh, create a vision for a new way of doing something. And I think that in just whether you agree with it or not, it's a fascinating story that is really um, also unprecedented access. So we had privileged, uh, unique behind the scenes access. Um, and my hope is that the film will create that awareness and create that dialogue that is so necessary. And most of the world eats meat and that's a reality. And research indicates that as the world population continues to grow, um, that meat uh, demand will double by 2050. So, to me, it's a no-brainer in terms of, I think this is not just the future, but it's it's now. It's happening right now. And I also love that as a story because it's not just about an idea that is, you know, um, in the future. It's about an idea that is unfolding and, and uh, that is tangible right now. And... Um, I feel really committed as a, as a filmmaker who um, believes that documentaries are vehicles for um, change. We, 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 can, we can use our skills as filmmakers to make a difference in the world for the good. And, and the good, again, is not around like convincing everyone to be or think a certain way but rather to open, open our minds and, and bring people together to uh, consider um, deeply um, what's possible. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you a few questions, or one question at least, uh, kind of a bit of a side note, but I figure since I have someone here who is a professional filmmaker, uh, storyteller, I guess. I'm always a bit curious, you know, I'm doing a podcast here that's solely kind of focused on science, but I've struggled a lot um, with the science journalists, the science communication crowd to try and get people into new idea, new ways of presenting science. I feel like a lot of times it's very the same, you know, a lot of science shows are, are very much the same. Do you when you're approaching a, a subject like this, because I do think that you, you know, in your film, we weren't beaten over the head with the science process behind it. You know, it really is the characters and you get, you know, we get the, an idea of the science and how it works. But so I'm just kind of curious as to if you're when you're approaching a scientific topic, what sort of your how do you find it's best to tell these stories? What is it that people can grasp and relate to in terms of, you know, telling a great science story or getting that out there? Great question. That was one of the greatest challenges in telling the story because um, in, the, in the edit suite, um, it was an ongoing sort of deep dive discussion and process of discovery um, around how much is too much and how much is too little and trying to find the right tone and balance and approach to unpacking a big idea in a way that doesn't um, 
weight the film down in cumbersome detail that feels abstract or uh, creates a disconnect for the viewer. Um, and also, importantly, <clears throat> and this goes back to what I said previously around humanizing the film through a character-driven storyline, and that being the you need a heart and soul, you need a center in a, in a film like this. Otherwise, um, you risk sort of placing the film in a, in a realm of abstraction, or uh, if it becomes too sterile or futuristic or cool, then it becomes overly intellectual. And it is highly intellectual. And that's good, it makes you think. But you want it to be accessible. You want it to touch people in a way that can also be emotional. Um, and so that is the balancing act. And so I'm, as you know, you're someone that really understands science and you have a mind for it. And, and I like what you said. You said that it touches on the science enough. I think that's what you said, I hope. Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah, I think that's what I said. <laughs> Okay, well, that's a good feedback because um, the, the fear, of course, is that you're not giving people enough information. Uh, the, and then the opposite is true. The fear is that you're giving people too much information and that they're overloaded with too many details. So, again, laboring over that um, balance and those, that minutia was a... Was a um, a challenge, but I feel like we, we got there. I hope we got there. So, mm -hmm. yeah, no, yeah. My, like, I think what I said at the beginning was we weren't beaten over the, over the head with the details of it, but we still got to understand the process enough to, to, to grasp. Okay. I understand what they're doing. They're growing, they're taking cells and they're growing the meat, you know? Um, and then from there you get to, that's really all you need to know. And I think that sometimes that's what, um, science communication science media what it struggles with sometimes is uh, at least i know like i was a former scientist before moving into this career and so i deal with scientists i know them and that's their struggle always is well people won't understand they need to know all of the minutia when really a lot of times less less can be more and i feel like there's just so many great like science impacts our lives in such a big way. We talked about this at the beginning, how, you know, innovation is going to be needed to, to solve some of these, these big issues that we're facing. So it really is a personal, these really are personal stories. You know, we mentioned too, the food is such a personal connection. So yeah, it was again, well done by you in the film. And I just wanted to, to ask about that, to see how you approach it. So to get any tips or anything. Um, as we wind up here, uh, I have to ask, uh, did you get to try the meat product or did you try the meat product? And if so, what did you think? Yeah, I try. I was, I was privileged to try it a couple of times and then I received a hoodie and a water bottle that says Memphis meats first bite. <laughs> so I'm, part of that. I'm a member of that little elite club, I guess you could call it of, you know, um, I've, I've tried something that is so incredibly, you know, mind jaw dropping and, 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 and it's when you, you know, in it's innovation. And, um, for me, um, I happily tried it and, uh, it didn't feel like a risk or anything at all to try it. It also did not feel... Um, like an ethical dilemma for me to try it because I'm someone that actually doesn't eat meat at all. And I haven't eaten meat uh, for decades. Um, and I, and I, and that's, a, that's an ethical decision for me based on the treatment of animals, based on the environmental destruction that the conventional meat industry uh, creates in the world. I don't need to eat meat for my health. So, you know, trying trying the, the Memphis meats um, cell cultured uh, poultry or clean poultry was uh, was mind blowing. 
because it it exact it, it reminded me exactly of what I remember meat to taste like and to feel like when I'm not chewing it and tasting it. So it was pretty cool. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that was the one thing. Uh, my wife watched the film with me and that's what we were both saying the whole time is we were just, I want to try it. I want to try it because we also have, maybe we're not 100% vegetarian, but we've drastically, drastically cut our meat consumption, you know, probably 90% vegetarian and largely because of, you know, some of the same thing, the environmental aspects, the issues with factory farming and stuff. So, and I think that there's a lot of people that that's the thing is when I made that switch, I was thinking, you know, we tried some plant-based alternatives and stuff. And I just kept thinking, why am I trying to replace that flavor with something that's not that? Like it never really works. You know, it's, they can be good. They can taste good. But if I'm going to eat vegetarian, I'm just going to make some delicious vegetarian food and not try and chase this, this meat. But from what we're hearing about these products is that maybe this is it. Maybe this is the good tasting. It will, it could satisfy all those needs. So that's really, really fascinating. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time uh, to join us on the show and to uh, talk about the film. Uh, again, Meet the Future is the, is the name. Uh, maybe you can just let people know um, when and where they'll be able to see the film, where they can see your other works. And if you want to tease something that you got coming up in the future, we're all ears. Sure. So Thursday, May 7th, uh, here in Canada is our national um, Canadian broadcast premiere on CBC. And it's in association with Hot Docs, which is North America's largest film, uh, documentary film festival. And I'm alumni there. And so I'm, I'm, I feel really privileged and excited to um, be one of seven uh, documentaries that is called Hot Docs at Home on CBC. And uh, so again, Thursday, May 7th uh, is our premiere. And then um, following that, um, I can't really announce, um, unfortunately, yet um, other dates, mm -hmm. but it's all in process, it's all in motion. Um, one thing I can announce is that in New Zealand, there's a wonderful documentary film festival that takes place later this spring called Doc Edge, and it's um, a wonderful film festival, and, the, and Meet the Future will be uh, part of that film festival. So I would say in a nutshell, uh, we'll continue to be part of film festivals as they innovate ways of, you know, presenting their catalog online for, for people to um, experience new, new 2020 titles like Meet the Future. Um, and then um, we're working with, um, you know, um, a big, uh, you know, international uh, way for people to see the film in, in, a, in a great, on a great platform coming soon. There's no <clears throat> sort of secure concrete plans yet, but we're working on it and the film will get out there and people will see it. In the meantime, we encourage everyone to follow us online, to join the conversation, to learn more, to pipe in and uh, join us in this journey. So meetthefuture.com is the website. And of course it's M-E-A-T for Meet the Future. <laughs> uh, we're also on Facebook, we're on Twitter, and we're on Instagram. Um, and that's Meet the Future uh, or MTF Film. So join us and, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, and we will provide links to all that on our social media and our website so people can go there and find it. So once again, thank you very much, Liz Marshall, for joining us. Thank you so much, Bradley. Awesome. There we have it. Many thanks to Liz Marshall. Again, go to lizmars.com. Go to meetthefuturefilm.com or mtffilm.com and look for Meet the Future on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at mtffilm. Uh, 
always follow us at 2 bread for you Submit your questions for the 50th episode. Go to 2 bread for youwordpresscom to submit questions for the 50th episode. Hit me up on Twitter, Instagram, at bvamparadon uh, to get those questions in, or Bradley W. Hayes to hit up Brit Brad. That's on Twitter and Instagram, of course. You all know this. Uh, rate, subscribe, follow us. We really appreciate it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that conversation, and we're going to continue to look for more cellular-based meat stuff in the future. Thanks so much, folks, for listening, and we'll catch you later. Bye.